apparently, due to repeated misuse, the Oxford English Dictionary has redefined the word literally. Did you know that? Happened a few years ago. Apparently, it no longer officially just means factually true. It now also means a word used for emphasis. And uh, it seems to have inspired others to have a go at redefining words too. Uh, For example, uh, feet, a device used for finding Lego in the dark. I know that one well. Or calories, the tiny creatures that live in your closet and sew your clothes a little bit tighter every night. Uh, Then there's this one. Oh, I still don't understand. Uh, Clapping, repeatedly high-fiving yourself for someone else's accomplishments. And then lastly, awkward, when you say bye to someone and then walk in the same direction. I've certainly had that happen to me. Well, as we come to look at words of knowledge and words of wisdom this morning, a good place to start is by defining exactly what we're talking about. What is a word of wisdom? Well, I think a word of wisdom is, uh, can be summed up as a message that God places in our minds, which is usually both simple and yet profound, in line with Scripture, relevant, and which often cuts through a confusion that we might be feeling to bring clarity to a situation. It's the kind of thing someone usually responds to with, do you know what, I've never seen it like that before, or I've kept coming back to what you said, or that's so simple, but so true. Jesus used this gift uh, when the Pharisees questioned why he was eating with tax collectors and sinners, and he replied, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. And when he was questioned about paying taxes to Caesar, and he got out a coin with Caesar's face on it, and he said, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. But a word of knowledge is different from a word of wisdom, and from prophecy, which we're going to come on to look at in future weeks. Prophecy is a foretelling of what will happen in the future, or a foretelling of God's will or feeling about a situation. It's about what God is doing or will do. A word of knowledge is a supernatural revelation about people or situations, facts that God has revealed to us. They're about what people are doing or people are dealing with. So we need all three in the church, but over the next 20 minutes, we're going to look at growing in, giving out, and getting right words of wisdom and knowledge. Uh, But before we do that, let's pray and invite God to speak to us through his word. Father, we thank you that as we've already dwelt upon this morning, you are a good, good father who loves to give good gifts to his children when we ask you. And we thank you for these gifts that we're thinking about uh, over these few weeks. And thank you that uh, for your spirit Uh, who these gifts are from, and we we pray this morning that you would lift our faith and our eyes to you uh, as we see uh, what you can do and are doing through us, through your church, and in your world. For Jesus' sake, amen. Well, first, how do we grow in these gifts? Uh, In 2008, the Canadian author Malcolm Gladwell wrote a book called Outliers, I don't know if you've heard of that book, but it, it, it said that anyone who practices the same thing for 10,000 hours can become an expert in it. And it was backed up by all kinds of research. And it's now become a bit of an unquestioned mantra that, uh, about natural gifts. Uh, but most of us think of spiritual gifts very differently, don't we? We tend to think uh, that you either have a spiritual gift or you don't based on the whim of God. What if instead, like natural gifts, gifts of the Spirit, and especially gifts of knowledge and wisdom, are open to us all, they just need to be nurtured, practiced, and cultivated before they reach maturity? When it comes to the word gifts, like words of knowledge and words of wisdom, Mark Aldridge, who preached at St. Andrews, actually, a couple of years ago on the Sunday morning that our daughter Felicity was baptised, Uh, He speaks of uh, learning the language of God. He says it may take a little time and patience at first, like learning any new language. The cadences and the rhythms might feel strange to us. But the more we practice, the more comfortable we'll feel. So how do we do that? 
Well, first, we have to take some time to listen to the language being spoken. Uh, When Amy was uh, starting out as a French teacher, she, for a while, wanted us to move to France uh, so that she could uh, grow in her French uh, speaking because she was worried that her French wasn't good enough. In the end, it turned out that people uh, had a higher view of her abilities than she did, and then she did, and we, thankfully we stayed here in the UK. But her logic was that the more time you spend in a, a, around a foreign language, the more opportunities you have to hear it, the quicker you will begin to pick it up. And it's the same with us and the voice of God. And so practicing words of knowledge and wisdom means, first of all, practicing listening to the voice of God. And that means making time to be in his presence. I wonder if you've ever wondered how Jesus, despite becoming fully human in every way, as Hebrews says, was able to speak with such wisdom and such knowledge. How was he able to tell the woman by the well who he'd just met that she had five husbands? Or tell the Pharisees exactly what was going on inside their heads when he healed and forgave the paralytic man? Those words of knowledge came to him so quickly because he didn't just find time for the Father out of his busy schedule. He lived to be with his Father in heaven. He was always off in prayer, so he was always able to know what the Father was doing, even as he was out and about, what he was saying and revealing. But once we've practiced listening to the voice of God, then practicing the gifts of wisdom and knowledge also means practicing obeying them. Obeying his voice. That means having a go at sharing what we think God might be saying, even at the risk of embarrassment or failure. Iris, our one and a half year old, is is just learning to speak at the moment. And uh, like all small children, she has her own little way of repeating the things she's heard. For example, when she drops something on the floor, she doesn't say, oh dear, she says, oh dull. I don't know if she's been watching The Simpsons. I haven't haven't had it on in our house. She's practicing to speak, and so she's not embarrassed about it when she gets it wrong because young children, they're not weighed down by that fear of looking foolish in the way that we are, are they? And then the same way for us to grow in giving words of knowledge means us being willing to accept the risk of getting it wrong and being embarrassed and being okay with that. Pastor Jack Deere, in his book, Surprised by the Voice of God, it says the people he knows who, uh, who are really gifted in words of knowledge always have the four, same four things in common. They always believe God will speak to them, want him to speak to them and uh, to serve him and his people, pray for God to speak to them and act on words of knowledge when they come, even at the risk of looking foolish in front of others. It's been said that when Peter stepped out of the boat and walked on water, the water only hardened enough to bear his weight at the moment he put his foot on it. Why? Because God's gifts and God's power are only ever released at the end point of our obedience. As Mark Aldridge says, if we wait for absolute certainty, we'll never get out of the boat. Instead, God is calling each of us to a reckless pursuit where hungering after him is more important than our reputation. Bruce Collins, the former New Wine International Director, was on a flight from London to Finland when he prayed that God would give him an opportunity to speak to someone about Jesus. As people were boarding the plane, a smartly dressed woman in her 40s started making his way towards him and sat down in the seat next to him. Immediately, she got out her paper and started reading it. The woman's body language made it clear she had no interest in talking to him. So Bruce prayed, Lord, how am I going to open a conversation with her about you? And right then, as he prayed, some thoughts popped into his mind. He felt God saying that this woman didn't know Jesus, that she was a gifted teacher, someone who had real concerns over issues of justice for oppressed people, and who traveled as part of her work. When the woman put down her newspaper, Bruce took his chance and started a conversation. He felt God saying, use what I've given you. Use what I've given you, Bruce. And so he shared what he felt God had said. And before he'd finished speaking, the woman was looking at him in astonishment. Just as God had said, she was a teacher, gifted teacher. She was a lecturer in international law in London. 
Her subjects was human rights, particularly as related to oppressed people, and she frequently travelled for her work. And needless to say, the woman's newspaper remained on the floor for the rest of the flight as she peppered Bruce with questions about faith, and he was able to share his testimony with her. Years later, Mark Aldridge was sitting on a different plane next to a Swedish businessman, attempting the same thing with a man who seemed just as initially disinterested. Silently, Mark prayed, Lord, what are the names of his children? Thinking that'll get, that'll get his attention. A couple of names popped into his head and he confidently said, tell me about your kids, Anders and Maria. The man looked at him strangely and said, my children aren't called Anders and Maria. <laughs> Why did you say that? <laughs> You know, it's a a face palm moment, isn't it? It's a face palm moment. And yet, whilst the outcomes were different in both of these cases, both men have a proven gift of words of knowledge. And in these instances, both of them worshipped God by taking a risk, by acting out of a heart of obedience, and by being willing to be embarrassed for the sake of his kingdom. That's how we grow in the gifts of words of knowledge and words of wisdom. But why do we give these gifts? Why do we give gifts of words of knowledge and words of wisdom? What are they for? Ultimately, they're so that the person receiving them would know three things. That they would know that Jesus is God, that he knows all about them, and that he loves them and forgives all their sins. So even when a word of knowledge is about someone's sin, God's not revealed it to us so that we'll catch that person out or make them feel shame, but for us to provide an opportunity for God to demonstrate his love and his forgiveness to them. You know, the other day, Amy and I were eating fajitas, and uh, we got out all the appropriate condiments, the guacamole, the salsa, the sour cream, and I covered my first fajita in the sour cream, and uh, Julie munched all the way through it. And as I was getting my second fajita ready, I got the sour cream ready again, and I noticed that all around the inside of the bottom of the bottle, bottle was covered in mould. That's pretty disgusting. Uh, but as Amy said, it was a good job in one way that I realised after I'd eaten the first fajita, because otherwise, uh, I, I, if I'd have realised once I'd poured out the sour cream and before I'd eaten it, I'd have had to throw the fajita away. I wasn't ill, miraculously, wonderfully, so I just enjoyed a very tasty fajita. Uh, But when God has someone deliver a genuine word of knowledge for us about our mistakes, past or present, it's his way of saying, I want you to know that I see the mold. In fact, I see you all the way to the bottom and I still love you and I still want to use you. And knowing that, I'm not going to throw you away, but I do want to show you another way. That's what words of knowledge can often be about. And so a word of knowledge used in the right way can bring incredible freedom. Jack Deere tells of a time when he went to a conference and the speaker had a word about his parents, who by a word of knowledge, the speaker even named correctly. The word itself was an assurance that Jack's father was in heaven And the person delivering it said the reason that Jack needed to know this, uh, needed to know that uh, his dad's eternal destiny was because not knowing the question of where his father was had led to a root of bitterness growing up in his heart. And that caused Jack to become harsh towards others. Jack was stunned. Even though he hadn't thought much about his dad in recent years or months, the removal of harshness was something that Jack had been praying about. And reflecting on that moment, he says, today I'm not as gentle as I would like, but neither am I as harsh as I used to be. And I know that word of knowledge has been a significant factor in my transformation. Words of knowledge are also gifts to comfort us. The Bayou Tapestry depicts the events leading up to and including the Battle of Hastings in 1066 between William the Conqueror and Harold Godwinson. In one part of the tapestry, William is depicted prodding the rear end of one of his troops with a spear. It looks extremely uncomfortable. But the words underneath say, The king comforteth 
his troops. It doesn't look like comfort, but it's the comfort of kings. It's the comfort that says, I am with you and together we can do this. Let's go into battle. And that's what words of knowledge and wisdom do. About nine months into my first curacy, Amy and I went to visit a church in Manchester where nobody knew us and nobody was expecting us to turn up. And at the end of the worship, the associate pastor who'd been leading the service stepped down and made a beeline straight for us. And uh, I wondered what was going on. Uh, But she said uh, that uh, she felt she needed to pray for us. And as she prayed, the most remarkable thing happened. She began to share words of knowledge that described exactly our situation at the time. She described my job as a curate, the way we were feeling, and what was happening in our church. She even gave me a word of knowledge, which to this day is Amy's favorite word of all time. She turned to me and said, you need to start listening to your wife. (laughs) I've never lived that one down. And she said, because... (laughs) Because you didn't listen to your wife, uh, that's how you got into this situation. And, uh, and uh, do you know what? After that, I felt a total sense of certainty that I was seen by God and that he was with us. A few weeks later, I was talking to a friend I trained with. I was busy explaining to him how miserable I was and how much I hated my job because I had nothing to do. But I felt I had to keep going because Jesus calls us to take up our cross and follow him. After listening a while, he turned to me and with crystal clarity, he said, you're not suffering for Christ if you're not being allowed to serve Christ. You're just suffering for the sake of it. It was a word of wisdom. It was the word I needed that cut through all the confusion and brought clarity to the situation. It gave me the courage to take the right decision about the way forward for us. A word of knowledge and a word of wisdom both strengthened and encouraged us. So these gifts are important, but how do we use them in the right way? First of all, by starting with love. Growing up, uh, my mum used to like to tell a story, particularly whenever we had lamb for dinner, about a time when she was a child and she was taken to a lambing farm. And, uh, and uh, she spent the entire day falling in love with these cute and cuddly little animals. And then at the end of the day, the children were taken to the farm restaurant for their dinner. And the only thing on the menu was lamb. She says, however much she loved lamb and loves eating lamb to this day, she couldn't do it. She couldn't eat the meat because her heart was full of love for the animal. And in the same way, it's always a good rule of thumb to ask God to fill our hearts with love for the person we're praying for before we ask for a word of knowledge or a word of wisdom. Because that way, it's much harder for us to use the gifts of the Spirit to harm them in any way. Second, pause before sharing. In John 8, Jesus is confronted by the Pharisees who've brought to him a woman caught in the act of adultery. They say in the law of Moses, the law of Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? What does he do? If he shows leniency and lets her go, they can accuse him of denying the law. But if he condemns her and demands her immediate death, they can accuse him of lacking compassion. They think they've got him trapped. But his immediate response is a lesson to us all. We're told Jesus bent down and started to write in the ground with his finger. Jesus was giving himself time. A few precious moments to listen to what the father was saying and to receive heavenly wisdom before he spoke. And if Jesus needed to do that, how much more do we? Words of wisdom will likely come to us only when we pause in the heat of the moment to listen to God before we speak. And words of knowledge, sometimes even even bigger pause than that. Jack Deere tells the story of a young single mother who came into his office for counselling. She and the man she was dating were serving as Sunday school teachers in the church. She'd come to talk about a problem with her children, but while she was talking, Jack had a distinct impression for the Holy Spirit that she was sleeping with the man she was dating. 
He wanted to talk to him about it, but before doing so, he prayed and asked God if he had his permission to act on the word. Immediately, he got a strong sense of God saying, no. Six to eight weeks later, at the end of a Sunday evening service on sexual morality, the senior pastor called people forward, uh, both as a sign of repentance and to be prayed for. To Jack's surprise, 200 people made their way to the front, so many that they were backing up through the aisles. And who should Jack see knelt in the aisle next to his seat but the same young couple? Jack and his wife stepped out of their chairs and knelt with them. The couple shared their story and and it was just as Jack had heard God saying those weeks before. From there, they begin to pray for them and help them with the process of restoration. In Jack's words, God and I had two very different ways of handling that situation. I wanted to confront immediately. God wanted to wait. And that's not uncommon. Very often the Lord will deny permission to share a negative impression because he has a better way of handling the situation. But finally, we share with humility. A couple of weeks ago, I was playing the game Linky uh, with some friends on a weekend away. The rules are once you've guessed the correct answers, you shout out the link between those answers to the questions. And my key teammates kept commenting on how funny it was that I often sounded so uncertain when I shouted out, but almost always got it right. And in a funny way, that's what sharing words of knowledge or wisdom humbly looks like. Because it's far better to say, I sense the Lord possibly revealing this or might be saying that than to say, Thus says the Lord. That way the person can take it away with them and what's true and of the Lord will stick and what's just come from us will just fall away. So to come to a close, we've got some time now to wait on God and to press in to the gifts he wants to give to us. And I'm going to invite the band to join me back on stage. Let me ask you as we come to this point in our service. Do you want to receive these gifts? Do you, want, do you need a word of wisdom? Do you sense the difference that growing in a word of knowledge could make in your workplace, on your commute, in your street, in your family? If so, my encouragement to us this morning would be, come and be prayed for. Come and be prayed for. After all, Jesus promises us that the Lord gives good gifts to those who ask him. All we have to do is step out and take that first small step to to the front and then keep stepping out of the boat next week and the week after that and the week after that and the week after that as we discern God's voice and share it with others. And that journey can start today. So let me pray and then we're going to have some space for us to to, to wait on God and invite the ministry team to the front. Um, I'm not sure how many ministry team looking out are here this morning. So if you are trained Uh, to pray for others in the church. Can I encourage you to come forward uh, to pray with people this morning? Let's uh, stand and let's invite God to meet with us as we pray and worship him. Father, we thank you that you are worth so much more than our reputation. And we thank you that where we feel weak, you are strong. And in all our weakness this morning, we pray that you would meet us in your strength. Pour out your spirit afresh on us. Lord, where we've given in to cynicism or or doubt, Lord, build faith in this place and in our hearts. Lord, help us to take risks for you. Fill us with a spirit of boldness and pour out your gifts on your people afresh. we were praying before the service we had a couple of potential words of knowledge for healing one about someone who's got a problem with their ankle and another who's got a problem with their lungs if either of those uh, relate to something you're going through at the moment then can I encourage you to come and be prayed for we'd love to pray for God to pour out his healing on you this morning and if as we're praying and worshipping you feel the Lord saying something please do come and find someone and I we'd love to share 
that word with the church. Lord, we want to want to know you more. We want to encounter you this morning. Pull your spirit out afresh. Come and meet with us.